Section 10 of Good Sense. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. Good Sense by Paul Henri Thierry, Baron Dolbach. Translator Unknown. Section 10. Parts 100 through 109. 100. What is the soul? The superiority which men arrogate over other animals is chiefly founded upon their opinion that they have the exclusive possession of an immortal soul. But ask them what this soul is, and they are puzzled. They will say it is an unknown substance, a secret power distinct from their bodies, a spirit of which they have no idea. Ask them how this spirit, which they suppose to be, like their god, wholly void of extension, could combine itself with their material bodies, and they will tell you they know nothing about it, that it is to them a mystery, that this combination is an effect of the omnipotence of God. These are the ideas that men form of the hidden, or rather imaginary substance, which they consider as the mainspring of all their actions. If the soul is a substance essentially different from the body, and can have no relation to it, their union would be not a mystery, but an impossibility. Besides, this soul being of a nature different from the body must necessarily act in a different manner. Yet we see that this pretended soul is sensible of the motions experienced by the body, and that these two substances, essentially different, always act in concert. You will say that this harmony is also a mystery, but I will tell you that I see not my soul, that I know and am sensible of my body only, that it is this body which feels, thinks, judges, suffers, and enjoys, and that all these faculties are necessary results of its own mechanism or organization. 101. The existence of a soul is an absurd supposition. Although it is impossible for men to form the least idea of the soul, or the pretended spirit which animates them, yet they persuade themselves that this unknown soul is exempt from death. Everything proves to them that they feel, that they think, that they acquire ideas, that they enjoy and suffer only by means of the senses, or material organs of the body. Admitting even the existence of this soul, they cannot help acknowledging that it depends entirely upon the body and undergoes all its vicissitudes, and yet it is imagined that this soul has nothing in its nature similar to the body, that it can act and feel without the assistance of the body, in a word, that this soul, freed from the body and disengaged from its senses, can live, enjoy, suffer, experience happiness, or feel excruciating torments. Upon such a tissue of absurdities is built the marvelous opinion of the immortality of the soul. If I ask what are the motives for believing the soul immortal, they immediately answer that it is because man naturally desires to be immortal. But because you desire a thing ardently, can you infer that your desire will be fulfilled? By what strange logic can we dare affirm that a thing cannot fail to happen because we ardently desire it? Are desires, begotten by the imagination, the measure of reality? The impious, you say, deprived of the flattening hope of another life, wish to be annihilated. Very well. May they not then as justly conclude from their desire that they shall be annihilated, as you may conclude from your desire that you shall exist forever? 102. It is evident that man dies in toto. Man dies, and the human body after death is no longer anything but a mass incapable of producing these motions of which the sum total constituted life. We see that it has no longer circulation, respiration, digestion, speech, or thought. It is pretended that the soul is then separated from the body, but to say that this soul, with which we are unacquainted, is the principle of life, is to say nothing, 
unless that an unknown power is the hidden principle of imperceptible movements. Nothing is more natural and simple than to believe that the dead man no longer lives. Nothing is more extravagant than to believe that the dead man is still alive. We laugh at the simplicity of some nations whose customs is to bury provision with the dead under an idea that it will be useful and necessary to them in the other life. Is it then more ridiculous or absurd to suppose that men will eat after death than to imagine that they will think, that they will be actuated by agreeable or disagreeable ideas, that they will enjoy or suffer, and that they will experience repentance or delight? after the organs adapted to produce sensations or ideas are once dissolved to say that the souls of men will be happy or unhappy after death is in other words to say that men will see without eyes hear without ears taste without palates smell without noses and touch without hands and persons who consider themselves very reasonable adopt these ideas 103. Incontestable Arguments Against the Spirituality of the Soul The dogma of the immortality of the soul supposes the soul to be a simple substance, in a word, a spirit. But I ask again, what is a spirit? It is, say you, a substance void of extension, incorruptible, having nothing common with matter. If so, how is your soul born? and how does it grow? How does it strengthen or weaken itself? How does it get disordered and grow old, in the same progression as your body? To all these questions you answer that these are mysteries. If so, you cannot understand them. If you cannot understand them, why do you decide about a thing of which you are unable to form the least idea? To believe or affirm anything it is necessary at least to know in what it consists. To believe in the existence of your immaterial soul is to say that you are persuaded of the existence of a thing of which it is impossible for you to form any true notion. It is to believe in words without meaning. To affirm that the thing is as you say is the height of folly or vanity. 104 on the absurdity of the supernatural causes. Are not theologians strange reasoners? Whenever they cannot divine the natural causes of things, they invent what they call supernatural, such as spirits, occult causes, inexplicable agents, or rather words, much more obscure than the things they endeavor to explain. Let us remain in nature when we wish to account for the phenomena of nature. Let us be content to remain ignorant of causes too delicate for our organs, and let us be persuaded that by going beyond nature we shall never solve the problems which nature presents. Even upon the hypothesis of theology, that is, supposing an all-powerful mover of matter, by what right would theologians deny that their God has power to give this matter the faculty of thought? Was it then more difficult for him to create combinations of matter from which thought might result than spirits who could think? At least by supposing matter which thinks, we should have some notions of the subject of thought or of what thinks in us, whereas by attributing thought to an immaterial being, it is impossible to form the least idea of it. 105. It is false that materialism degrades. It is objected against us that materialism makes man a mere machine, which is said to be very dishonorable. But will it be much more honorable for man if we should say that he acts by the secret impulses of a spirit, or by a certain I know not what, that animates him in a manner totally inexplicable? It is easy to perceive that the supposed superiority of spirit over matter, or of the soul over the body, has no other foundation than men's ignorance of this soul, while they are more familiarized with matter, with which they imagine they are acquainted, and of which they think they can discern the origin. 
but the most simple movements of our bodies are to every man who studies them as inexplicable as thought. 106. It is false that materialism degrades. The high value which so many people set upon spiritual substance has no other motive than their absolute inability to define it intelligibly. The contempt shown for matter by our metaphysicians arises only from the circumstance that familiarity begets contempt. When they tell us that the soul is more excellent and noble than the body, they say what they know not. 107. Idea of future life only useful to priests' trade. The dogma of another life is incessantly extolled as useful. It is maintained that even though it should be only a fiction, it is advantageous because it deceives men and conducts them to virtue. But is it true that this dogma makes men wiser and more virtuous? Are the nations who believe this fiction remarkable for purity of morals? Has not the visible world ever the advantage over the invisible? If those who are trusted with the instruction and government of men had knowledge and virtue themselves, they would govern them much better by realities than by fictions. But crafty, ambitious, and corrupt legislators have everywhere found it better to amuse with fables than to teach them truths, to unfold their reason, to excite them to virtue by sensible and real motives, in fine, to govern them in a rational manner. Priests undoubtedly had reasons for making the soul immaterial. They wanted souls to people the imaginary regions which they have discovered in the other life. Material souls would, like all bodies, have been subject to disillusion. Now, if men should believe that all must perish with the body, the geographers of the other world would evidently lose the right of guiding men's souls towards that unknown abode. They would reap no profits from the hope with which they feed them and the terrors with which they oppress them. If futurity is of no real utility to mankind, it is at least of the great utility to those who have assumed the office of conducting them thither. 108. It is false that the idea of a future life is consoling. But, it will be said, is not the dogma of the immortality of the soul comforting to beings who are often very unhappy here below? Though it should be an error, is it not pleasing? Is it not a blessing to man to believe that he shall be able to enjoy hereafter a happiness which is denied him upon earth? Thus, poor mortals, you make your wishes the measure of truth, because you desire to live forever, and to be happier, you at once conclude that you shall live forever, and that you shall be more fortunate in an unknown world than in this known world, where you often find nothing but affliction. Consent, therefore, to leave, without regret, this world which gives the greater part of you much more torment than pleasure. Submit to the order of nature, which demands that you, as well as all other beings, should not endure forever. We are incessantly told that religion has infinite consolations for the unfortunate, that the idea of the soul's immortality, and of a happier life, is very proper to elevate man, and to support him under adversity, which awaits him upon earth. It is said, on the contrary, that materialism is an afflicting system calculated to degrade man. Then it puts him upon a level with the brutes, breaks his courage, and shows him no other prospect than frightful annihilation capable of driving him to despair and suicide whenever he is unhappy. The great art of theologians is to blow hot and cold, to afflict and console, to frighten and encourage. It appears by theological fictions that the regions of the other life are happy and unhappy. Nothing is more difficult than to become worthy of the abode of felicity. Nothing is more easy than to obtain a place in the abode of torment, which God is preparing for the unfortunate victims of eternal fury. 
have those men who think the other life so pleasant and flattering forgotten that according to them that life is to be attended with torments to the greater part of mortals is not the idea of total annihilation infinitely preferable to the idea of an eternal existence attended with anguish and gnashing of teeth is the fear of an end more afflicting than that of having had a beginning the fear of ceasing to exist is a real evil only to the imagination, which alone begat the dogma of another life. Christian ministers say that the idea of a happier life is joyous. Admitted. Every person would desire a more agreeable existence than he enjoys here. But if paradise is inviting, you will grant that hell is frightful. Heaven is very difficult, and hell very easy to be merited. Do you not say that a narrow way leads to the happy regions, and a broad way to the regions of misery? Do you not often say that the number of the elect is very small, and that of the reprobate very large? Is not grace, which your God grants but to a very few, necessary to salvation? Now, I assure you that these ideas are by no means consoling, that I had rather be annihilated, once for all, than to burn forever, that the fate of beasts is to me more desirable than that of the damned, that the opinion which relieves me from afflicting fears in this world appears to me more joyous than the uncertainty arising from the opinion of a god who, master of his grace, grants it to none but his favorites, and permits all others to become worthy of eternal torment. Nothing but enthusiasm or folly can induce a man to prefer improbable conjectures attended with uncertainty and insupportable fears. 109. All religious principle are derived from the imagination. All religious principles are the work of pure imagination, in which experience and reason have no share. It is extremely difficult to combat them, because the imagination, once prepossessed by chimeras which astonish or disturb it, is incapable of reasoning. To combat religion and its phantoms with the arms of reason is like using a sword to kill gnats. As soon as the blow is struck, the gnats and chimeras come hovering round again and resume in the mind the place from which they were thought to have been forever banished. When we reject as too weak the proofs given of the existence of a god, they instantly oppose to the arguments, which destroy that existence, an inward sense, a deep persuasion, an invincible inclination, born in every man, which holds up to his mind, in spite of himself, the idea of an almighty being whom he cannot entirely expel from his mind, and whom he is compelled to acknowledge, in spite of the strongest reasons that can be urged. But whoever will analyze this inward sense upon which such stress is laid will perceive that it is only the effect of a rooted habit which, shutting their eyes against the most demonstrative proofs, subjects the greater part of men, and often even the most enlightened, to the prejudices of childhood. What avails this inward sense, or this deep persuasion, against the evidence which demonstrates that whatever implies a contradiction cannot exist? We are gravely assured that the non-existence of God is not demonstrated. Yet, by all that men have hitherto said of him, nothing is better demonstrated than that this God is a chimera, whose existence is totally impossible since nothing is more evident than that a being cannot possess qualities so unlike, so contradictory, so irreconcilable, as those which every religion upon earth attributes to the divinity. Is not the theologian's God, as well as that of the deist, a cause incompatible with the effects attributed to it? Let them do what they will, it is necessary either to invent another God, or to grant that he, who for so many ages has been held up to the terror of mortals, is at the same time very good and very bad, very powerful and very weak, unchangeable and fickle, perfectly intelligent and perfectly void of reason, 
Of order and permitting disorder? Very just and most unjust? Very skillful and unskillful? In short, are we not forced to confess that it is impossible to reconcile the discordant attributes heaped upon a being of whom we cannot speak without the most palpable contradictions? Let anyone attribute a single quality to the divinity, and it is universally contradicted by the effects ascribed to this cause. End of section 10. Recording by Roger Moline.